other evidences for evolution what do you mean other apart from fossil of course we have discussed the fossils right so other evidences include biogeography homologous and analogous structures vestigial structures embryology molecular comparisons and microevolution in action we have seen most of these things early on in this uh, you know this course so first of all uh, uh, one question that perplexed uh, philosophers and natural historians for uh, a lot uh, you know for a long time is the age of earth how old the earth is so there, there is uh, there is a huge uh, contestation and uh, you know so there is a lot of discussions about it because as per as per the creation myth you know or intelligent design the earth is no older than 6000 years so it's highly unlikely right 6000 years we have a, a large number of proofs one of the simple proof is that uh, you know, we, we knew that the Earth's, the, the core of the Earth is, the inner core is molten, uh, you know, metals, right? So, uh, well, how we know that? Because of this, you know, this volcanic eruptions, isn't it? Where magma flows in. So, people already knew that the Earth, the core of Earth is really hot. So, how long does it take to cool down this molten iron sphere? Right. So first uh, of all, the Darwin he observed the Weald River in uh, in, in England, and uh, he saw that how long does the sediment accumulation takes, or even the weathering of the sediments in that river. So it's a very very slow process. So then you can actually look at that. Uh, you know, considering the same, uh, you know, the intensity of force has been happening for a long time. So that means that. Uh, the rate of such weathering of the rock or sedimentation or sediment accumulation had been constant, you know, uniformitarianism by Charles Lyell and James Hutton, you know. So they, they he, uh, I mean, Darwin read most of the Lyell's book and he only carried some of the Lyell's book in his uh, HMS Beagle exploration, right? Then he back calculated that how long uh, this weathering has been happening. Uh, which is around 300 million years is immensely old 300 million years and when Darwin said uh, that it is uh, the earth is 300 million years back then people start protesting especially William Thompson you know the Lord Kelvin very famous scientist much higher than uh, you know the uh, Charles Darwin during his lifetime very well accomplished physicist right so that is what the Kelvin temperature scale is named after Lord Kelvin so he protested. He said that no, it is only you know 20 million years because his reasoning had been a different kind of way to think. Time to cool molten rigid iron sphere. You know, you can actually uh, uh, more you know you can heat the iron sphere and you can you know you can melt it. So molten sphere to cool down to the present degree Celsius, how long will it take? And then you can just extrapolate this iron sphere to the uh, volume of the earth as a whole right and then he calculated it's he says that it's only 20 million years now we know that both of them were wrong but darwin is a bit more accurate it's uh, by his reasoning of very old uh, much better approximation you can see in uh, hindu tests right very very old immensely old almost 1 billion years back the earth has been formed many evolutionary biologists did say about that no uh, this particular how this uh, Ved Vedantic uh, concept of this cosmic and even the uh, you know the cyclic nature of this cosmos a quite accurate depiction of the uh, current consensus of the science you know so uh, yeah radiocarbon dating in early 20th century now we have accurate uh, you know prediction it is approximately 4.568 billion years course uh, with Vedic, Vedic or Vedantic concept is also very old almost 1 billion years but still inaccurate right it's really old 4.5 billion years right so this is how the the earth is you know as we can see this is the surface of earth but if you go inside inner core is solid while outer core is liquid right that is what is coming out during the volcanic eruptions isn't it then we have stiffer mantle and uh, rigid mantle and ice caps and all the crust isn't it so of course crust one section is ice cap in the poles right arctic pole and arctic and antarctic isn't it north and south poles 
coming the first level of evidence is biogeographic evidence where you can see the convergent evolution so convergent evolution means that uh, evolving similar attributes even though there is no homology right uh, i mean unrelated forms unrelated lineages similar features for example the, the butterflies and uh, wings of the birds you know insect appendage right butterfly wings or mosquito wings are not really wings and uh, uh, bird wings right these are also kind of convergent evolution isn't it so unrelated species living in different regions of the world with similar environmental features happen to look alike analogy or homoplasy in sequence uh, the homoplasy is uh, um, uh, at a uh, more appropriate term right so it supports the natural selection concept the adaptation to environmental factors for example uh, for example what uh, yeah you know the shark and dolphins right so the the main difference is that the the back the the fin you know one is vertical while the other one is horizontal right for flipping right so vertical is more like a fish isn't it so yeah so of course the dolphin is a mammal you see it's uh yeah the adaptation to the water has been secondary it had been a land dwelling animal like a hippopotamus the, the nearest relative is a hippo you know then it went back to the the ocean and it developed similar features it's quite unrelated lineage so this is an evidence of the evolution right so such features come in light when you do this comparative anatomy you compare different structures to declare that whether the structures are homologous or analogous you know so homologous structures are the structures different species uh, in different species share similar form but maybe different in function or same in function too so structures indicate uh, you know the, the shared common ancestor the homologous structures means uh, the organisms having those uh, structures are homologous or uh, they are they have same common ancestor example is arm bonds of various vertebrate organisms you know four limbs are quite similar right so if you look frog or lizard or bird or human cow whale cat all have similar kind of carpal you know radius ulna right then humerus all those bonds are co common in almost all vertebrates so this shows a deep homology that means that all these organisms all these species had one common ancestor that also had this feature so analog structure is quite different which we already explained identical functions but uh, you know externally look similar but uh, internally very different of like bird and insect wings so hummingbird and hummingbird moth you know so the, it's basically an insect while well, it's it's an a, a, aves right avian or reptile isn't it so vestigial structure provide yet another uh, you know sub, uh, it uh, provide evidence for the the uh, you know the evolution that these are structures that remain on the organism which have no purpose that means no function as of now or are not used for its original purpose anymore for example whale snake hip bones so even today we have uh, hip bones in the whales you know or dolphins or snakes so though there is no uh, you know there is a uh, apparently there is no function of all these things right so ostrich wings too right the wings of the ostrich even though there is no function for ostrich wings so human tailbone as well so coccyx right and wisdom teeth or appendix uh, right now we don't have any function for it but still these are existing right so all these are or the nipples of the male what is the function of it right it is nothing but sexual selection isn't it so wisdom teeth of human being Darwin's point on the ear which we explained earlier and ear muscles tonsils right so these are the problems or these are basically relics of uh, you know the the old uh, organism isn't it at one point in its evolution legacy it had a function for example uh, the whale pelvis that is the hip bone and a femur upper leg bone uh, right now there is no function but it did have the function when it was uh, an answer common it, it when it shared the common ancestor with hippopotamus it was a land animal you know later on it went back into the ocean isn't it so that femur is an it's an uh, evidence for the evolution you know 
so yeah so this is what uh, this is how of course if you look at the dolphin or whale evolution a large number of fossils you can see in uh, gujarat area the kutch area and uh, pakistan pakistan is also an epicenter of uh, the diversity <coughs> you know large number of fossils have been found there uh yes yeah, so if you can see that it had been a a land animal then it is a secondary adaptation to get into the dolphins and whales you know and yes we still have lots of uh, flightless birds like a cassowary a ostrich you know emu right kiwi all these are uh yeah so they do have wings which doesn't have any function you see so it, it is also a vestigial organ you can say but wings you see that it is a it's a, you know it is an example of exaptation uh, you know a change in the function of the trait right earlier we said that the original function of this wings had been warmed so uh, ostrich wings the function is still warm it didn't change into the locomotion you know so secondary function had been uh, you know the display sexual display and tertiary adaptation had been locomotion or to fly right another example of the vestigial organ is of human tail born the coccyx even today some of the babies are born with the cock the the tail isn't it virtual tail so that shows the the you know ancestry of human being at one point in our own evolution legacy we had been uh, an animal with tail you know so right now the tail born the coccyx has no function except that it hurts a lot when you fall onto it it can lead to serious spinal cord injuries you know so it is not really uh, optimal design isn't it so our body is not really optimal in several sense many people say that uh, look human body is a perfection it is not you know there are so many inconsistencies in our body as well uh, one example is the, the teeth so the babies are born with teeth and first set of teeth go falls and uh, re, you know the new set happens in the first one decade of our life right we all of our uh, you know the, the uh, teeth are new teeth but then then what for the next 90 years the same set of teeth you know you <laughs> you need actually replacement for every couple of years a uh, couple of decades but still we don't have it isn't it uh, at the same time shark another creature that has this kind of uh, uh, replacement of the new mm. new teeth you know new tooth can form after every few years you know that is much better isn't it and wisdom tooth is another example of the vestigial organ so right now we don't really have any function for this wisdom tooth an impacted wisdom tooth might lead to some infections and though surgical excision is not really re needed but in case it becomes uh, problematic then you need to remove it isn't it so yes so this is yet another example another example would be appendix right vermiform appendix right finger like projection in our gut so this is the the appendix here in between ilium and cecum the appendix right so it's an organ that is still used by other mostly herbivorous mammals to help them digest plants in their diet cellulose so to digest cellulose of course, uh, the animal cannot do it, but uh, we do have gut microbes, you know, so microbiome. So this vermiform appendix had been a house where this gut microbiome, cellulose digesting microbes used to live, you know. So that is a leftover, that is, that's a vestigial organ, you know, relics of our herbivorous ancestry, that is what it says. So right now there is no function, so it gets infected and it becomes a big problem it can even be uh, you know uh, uh, it can even challenge life people die because of the infection in untreated infection in the appendix so that is one of the reason why earlier days antarctic expedition mandates that your appendix should be removed even if you you didn't have any infection with appendix you need to remove it as a precaution because when you are in an antarctica you know the such surgery is not practical right very limited resources are there so yeah now that rule is no more there and there has been one surgeon in uh, i think it's in uh, you know the british antarctic survey and uh, he had this infection when he was in antarctica in british station and he excised his own appendix so this is the first instant where a surgeon performed surgery on his own body you know so very interesting isn't it 
so embryological evidence which we already discussed uh, when we spoke about um, uh, recapitulation theory right so embryos the way the embryos develop is quite similar to the way that organisms evolve you know so different organisms look extremely similar at early stages of the development and similarities begin to fade with further development because of the genes involved with this developmental pathways are highly conserved like Hox gene you know so embryological parallelism or recapitulation theory by Ernst Haeckel is this one no? so like fish salamander tortoise chicken pig cow rabbit and human if you look at here so this is the first few uh, you know few weeks a fish salamander is quite un indistinguishable right and later on the differences become apparent in the human embryo right so that is what and molecular evidence of course we have a large number of evidence right organisms uh, do share uh, the dna sequence to a great deal for example 97 percentage is the homology with chimpanzee and human being and the closer the organism uh, it's to its answers to the more molecular similarities exist like human chimps is around 98 percentage genomic similarity and blood proteins in humans and gorillas differ only by just one amino acid even though gorilla is not uh, very nearby still it's pretty near right so just after chimpanzee then it's uh, uh, you know gorilla right then comes orangutans and gibbons isn't it so some genes are almost identical in most of the animal kingdom like uh, cox gene right so uh, cox or dna polymerase all these genes are uh, very common in among all of the animal lineages and one organism's molecular sequence can work in another organism that is how we have this um, uh, you know this uh, genetic engineering for example the insulin right so how we are producing the insulin we are expressing this uh, insulin genes in yeast and even in e coli right so bacteria can also express some of our uh, you know of our recording dna sequences the molecular cloning and genetic engineering all these such proofs that evolution to work you know so uh, divergent evolution is a what resultant of all these variations so galapagos finches for example in response to adaptation you know so there is again that uh, adaptation and uh, adaptive radiation itself is a proof of evolution and then comes artificial evolution which we discuss when we talk about selection uh, you know artificial selection means uh, the human mediator isn't it so while wheat have seeds that break away shattering but for tens of thousands of years we selected and cultivated mutant wheat varieties that have seeds that fail to shatter which in fact is deleterious mutation so mostly the uh, you know the factors that we choose it for our own advantages the qtl quantitative trait loss i these traits are actually deleterious for the survival of the uh, species for example uh, you know pure breed uh, pedigree uh, you know cats and dogs doesn't have a good immune system the immune system is compromised you know so yes so artificial selection is very common in uh, plant breeding and animal breeding isn't it and mob sizes if you look the corn maize early on more primitive are very very small but nowadays it has become very big or chicken egg all these are because of the artificial selection chicken egg is also increasing because we are selecting those chicken that lays egg which are uh, bigger in size you know all these are artificial selection all these vegetables cauliflower broccoli cabbage kale kohlrabi are actually one species you know wild mustard species brassica oleracea right so all these are because of selective breeding the plant breeding again there is uh, artificial selection and the story of kettlewell's moth which we described when we spoke about artificial selection is yet another proof of evolution so as uh, the evolution of drug resistance you know in in bacteria the the drug resistance usually because of the horizontal gene transfer from one bacteria which has the plasmid coding for the drug resistance get into another bacteria you know so again that is a proof of the evolution so as what we can see right now the covid 19 sars cov 2 mutations start accumulating and evade the vaccines right like omicron variant isn't it all these are proof of evolution and uh, resistance like uh, antibiotic resistance 
we also have uh, uh, you know house flies and mosquitoes are getting resistant to the insecticides you know whenever this ddt started introducing uh, around the 1943s right and then suddenly soon after maybe after two three years the resistant varieties start emerging and uh, after a few years ddt became completely gone because resistant varieties have the frequency of this varieties increased tremendously because of the natural selection which is actually an artificial selection uh, the story is same for other insecticides like hch chlordane diazinone all these malathion right uh, fentheon everything so whenever this new thing is introduced for example malathion then soon after resistant and then uh, that insecticide became no more effective and that is the reason why we are inventing new new uh, variants of the insecticides and herbicides you know. so evolution of resistance in plants in response to herbicide as well you know. so different herbicide for example uh, diclofloc introduced in 1980 and soon after that 1987 the resistance got observed so all these are proofs of evolution evolution in action you know